Okay, I'm going to give an important talk right now, and I've got a very short little outline here of the points that I want to make. It's a very important talk. First thing I want to, uh, I'm going to lay it all out very carefully. And uh, the first thing I want to talk about is how this all got started. Uh, the It really got started back with the Federal Reserve Bank, back about a little bit over 100 years ago. They set up a monetary system that was designed to work um, uh, with growth, uh, designed to work with credit expansion. Um, every monetary unit that they created had debt attached to it, and they only created the monetary units. They never created the money needed to pay the debt that would, would accrue. Uh, <clears throat> So this system would work okay. Um, it provided that everything continued to expand around the globe. Businesses would expand, everything would expand, credit would expand, and it would keep expanding and expanding and expanding. And this system would work okay. Keep expanding the money supply. Keep expanding the growth. Keep expanding industry. Keep expanding everything. And this system would work. But the world is what's called finite. It means that they can't expand forever. Eventually, they get so they surround the entire globe with industry, and every last field has been burnt. Every last tree has been cut down. Every last uh, nugget of silver has been mined out of the ground. Every last barrel of oil has been dug out of the ground. And, and in the end, there's nothing left except a burnout wasteland of a planet. This was the system that was designed by the Federal Reserve. And it has to function this way. It's basically, it's an enormous Ponzi scheme. That's what it is. Okay? So let's get that straight. And that it relies upon credit expansion. Uh, these credit markets, they move in a wave pattern. They have a cycle. Up, down cycle. Like a wave. That's how all the markets move. They move in a wave cycle. But because of this credit expansion, this wave cycle with exponential growth, it's constantly going down, and the bottom's never lower than, and it's always the top is a little bit higher, and then the bottom is not quite as low as it was before, and then the top is a little bit higher each time, and the bottom's not quite as low, and it keeps going up and up and up. Now, if you look at the stock market, and look at it back to say 1910, or well, no, not 1910, but say 1925. Say go back to 1925 with the stock market, and uh, what you'll see is this this growth wave going all the way up to where it is now. It's just it's just constantly bigger and better and brighter every time it comes down and it goes back up. And that's the way all of it works. It all works the same way. It all works in a wave pattern. So once you understand that wave pattern, and it's that wave pattern is, now see I'm saying wave, right? Well, can you think of something else that sounds like a wave? Water. Water sounds like a wave. And they say the flow of money, right? They call money liquidity. It's liquid. It's a liquid asset. What's other? What's another liquid? It's water. It's water. It flows like water. It flows and ebbs in and out like water. It's like and it and it follows tidal patterns as well. So what happens is if we had these graves, waves of growth and contraction, and and we call them recessions. The contractions were called recessions, and then we had the periods of growth and so on. Okay, so get that straight. Uh, the whole world kept growing and growing and growing all the way around with industry and, and com commerce and monetarily too. It kept growing until it covered the entire earth. And now when did it cover the entire earth? And it just got to the point where the contraction, finally there was a contraction. Instead of exponential growth, we got to the point where the whole earth was saturated with exponential growth. And we finally hit the point where there was a contraction of everything. The first contraction. The first big major contraction. Now, the Great Depression was a contraction, but I'm talking about a worldwide contraction of everything. 
I'll tell you when it was. It was 2008. And it wasn't just a contraction of the monetary supply. But what they did was, is they covered the whole thing up, the, that contraction. They covered the whole thing up, and this is how they did it. They used monetary stimulus, quantitative easing and stimulus, to simulate growth in the, in the, on the monetary side of the whole thing. Okay? And that worked in conjunction with China simultaneously, creating real growth, but in craziness, building bridges to nowhere, building cities that are to this day empty. They're called ghost cities. They're the size of Chicago, using absolutely millions of tons of concrete rebar and, and just going crazy with this and borrowing all this money and creating all this infrastructure. So China was going on this infrastructure rampage. Okay? At the same time, monetary stimulus was just being pumped into the system everywhere. And at the same time, the, the United States became a oil-producing nation. So you get all three of these things coming together at the same time. So you get this major contraction in 2008, but these other three things coming together at the same time simulated that we were still in the exponential growth again. See what I mean? It simulated it. It simulated that we were still going through this period or this phase of exponential growth. But we weren't. It's all artificial. The Chinese ghost cities are artificial. The monetary stimulus is artificial. And yes, the United States did find shale, but in a way that's almost like it's artificial too because this shale is like digging into rock and it almost costs more money than what it's worth. They had to borrow a lot of money based on oil at $70 a barrel. The, the cost, I'm talking about the cost, their cost. They have to get like $100 a barrel to make a profit. They borrowed a lot of money from the banking system for this. This, is, this affected the derivatives market tremendously. And they borrowed this money so that they could stimulate, so that they could get this thing, this whole world going again. And they did for a while. It's called kicking the can down the road. They've kicked the can down the road on this artificial, enormous artificial, since 2008 till now, enormous artificial uh, simulation of exponential growth. Because the whole model is based on exponential growth. They've kept the ex exponential growth grow going artificially. But at this point, it's all done again on credit. And if you understand credit, the opposite side of the coin of credit is debt. And then the thing flips over that fast from credit to debt, credit to debt. And so basically what they've done is they've put the whole world in a state of complete and utter debt. It's a Ponzi scheme. And all Ponzi schemes hit the wall in the end. So what are they going to do? What they're coming to is an inflection point. So where are we on this uh, thing here? <clears throat> uh so, so now where we are is, <clears throat> uh, along with the United States becoming a major, oh, oh, we went through that, boosted the real economy along with monetary stimulus. Uh, okay, here's the point. Now where we're at with this. This monetary stimulus that they did and everything was absorbed by something even greater. All the money, they say, oh, they, they printed all this money. Actually, that's not true. They don't even have to print money anymore. They just touch a keyboard on a computer and they can create a trillion, gazillion, gazillion amounts of money. Monetary units are just creating them from thin air. So, we've got to the point now where They've created all these monetary units to stimulate the economy, but there's something absorbing it so that it didn't have the 
the effect everybody thought it was going to have. Everybody thought we were going to have this hyperinflation, and they thought we were going to have it in 2013, 2014, 2015. Everybody said 2016 for sure. We didn't have it. Why? Well, there's a number of reasons. One of the reasons is, is this deflation that occurred in 2008 was so ultra-powerful, this contraction, that it absorbed the monetary stimulus, almost like if you're trying to cool down a stove that's too hot and you throw a bucket of water on it. That first bucket of water just might come off and steam and the stove will still be hot. You see? And so what it did was it absorbed this monetary stimulus, it sucked it right up. And also, there's another effect here. It's called liquidity. It's a liquidity trap where the banks, because the interest rates are so damn low, the banks don't make much money, so they only lend out to really qualified lenders, borrowers, I mean. And how a lot of the money is created in the system is through fractional reserve banking. You see? Fractional reserve banking creates money. It's money creation. And, and so these bankers, they got this money from the Fed, huge voluminous amounts of money, but they just put it on their books. Simple as that. That's what's called a liquidity trap. The money just doesn't go anywhere. But because this money is created, it shows up on the velocity of money charts. Okay? It shows up on those charts, the money. Even though it's not going anywhere, it's sitting in a bank vault. That means that money's not moving. It's just sitting there in a bank vault because of the liquidity trap. So the money's sitting there in the bank vault. It's not moving, and it shows up. On the on the charts as as uh, as the uh, of the velocity of money, it shows the velocity of money falling off a cliff. That's because of all the stimulus is going into this liquidity trap, it's sucking it up. See, so we got this situation where all of that liquidity was sucked up, so it didn't make it into the system. But that liquidity is still there. That money's still there, and it and the banks have it. The banks have it so that they can, when they want to, they can start to lend it out. And at that point, that money will be lent out 10 times what they have because that's the magic of fractional reserve lending. You see? So, we got that point to make. And uh, this, uh, this whole thing, they've simulated the growth and... Uh, this this whole thing is is getting ready for the next major contraction. The Chinese real estate market is getting ready to turn over. The American real estate market is getting ready to turn over into a contraction. Everything is setting up for an enormous contraction. And Europe is just a boiling trigger for a contraction. But do not underestimate the determination the absolute determination of the world's central banks. This contraction that's coming is going to act as a trigger. And it is a deflationary event, enormous deflationary event. And Europe, Europe is, is just primed to set this contraction off with banking problems in Europe and stuff and, and all, the, all of the governments that are ready to fall in the European Union. And the whole Europe's, Euro, Euro is ready to go down the toilet hole. And so this is just ready, ripe and ready to set off this contraction. And the Chinese real estate market, is just, everything's just primed to set off this contraction. But do not underestimate these world central banks. These central banks have already told you. Ben Bernanke's already told you. He said that we have the tool to fight deflation. He said, if we have to, we will fly over with helicopters and we will dump $100 bills out of the helicopters. I mean, what part of this do these, these, these people, some of them are, are, uh, are very, very uh, uh, skilled uh, economists and they understand a lot about the economy, but what part don't they understand that the central banks have already told them? that they're not going to allow this deflation to go very far. It can act as a trigger. The deflation can act as a trigger to start the next phase from the central banks. But they've already told you what they're going to do. 
What aren't you understanding? What don't you get? What isn't getting across? They've told you they'll dump money out of helicopters if they have to. But they're not going to dump money out of helicopters if they're not triggered to do it. They're just going to sit there and they're going to let you have this little bit of deflation that they can handle. So you got a little bit of deflation. you got a little bit of deflation like we've had. We've been going through a little bit of deflation. And it's been no real big deal. And they've allowed it. They like it, in fact. It keeps it keeps the uh, it keeps the uh, uh, the rate of inflation down just to where they kind of they can play with it. They don't mind that a little bit of deflation, just a little bit. They don't mind that. They'll allow that. But it's a real serious burning hot deflation, and it hits suddenly with a ginormous c contraction. This is what triggers the world central banks. They already told you what they're going to do. And all they got to do is with one keystroke, they can do what they're going to do. And I have labeled what this is already. I've got it labeled here. I've got it labeled right here what this is. And I've dubbed what it is. I call it, <clears throat> let me see here. It's a new breed of stimulus. This helicopter money. I dub it. Hyper stimulus or hyper monetization. Maybe somebody else has come up with this term, but I've latched on to it, <laughs> and and I'm using it. Now I don't know. Maybe somebody else is ahead of me. Everybody's always getting ahead of you all the time, anyway, and everything. Maybe somebody else come up with it. They've probably already come up with it, but I'm using it. <laughs> Hyper stimulus or hyper monetization, it goes beyond and far beyond what they've ever done before once they're triggered this time. And they're right ready to get triggered. They, they got the helicopter money ready to go. And they're already throwing out some pilot programs and things that they're thinking about doing, like uh, tax rebates, where they just go back and they take a look at your social security number or social insurance number here in Canada. And they, uh, they basically say, uh, how much taxes has this guy paid over the years? You know? And uh, they got it all written down right there. They know how much taxes you paid, and they just send you a check. Right? So as they say, Mike, they say Mr. Johnson, he's paid uh, $280,000 in taxes. And he might be a normal guy. He's worked every year, you know, and made normal twenty, thirty thousand, 30000 whatever he makes. And he doesn't even know he's paid that much. Because he's he's... And all of a sudden, they, they cut him off a check for a quarter of a million dollars to every citizen. They've got this plan, this heli called helicopter money. That's just one idea that they've got. They've got other things up their sleeve, like a guaranteed income for all people. You know, it's guaranteed. I mean, they're throwing these trial balloons out there. They're getting people ready because they know that they're going to have to do this. They know this is coming, this helicopter money. They're going to have to get the money out there. They don't want liquidity traps stopping it. And so can can we say hyperinflation? <laughs> this whole thing is going to get triggered. Now, what I want to talk about is one of the ways that they've used to, to hold this off for as long as they have, and possibly some of the reasons why it didn't come in those years like 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, why it didn't come is uh, is 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 what the Amer what they get what they did first to protect the dollar. What they did to protect the dollar. It's amazing what they did to protect the dollar. The dollar index was going down, 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 down. And I'm going to tell you something. If the dollar index goes below 70, big trouble ensues, right? If it goes below 70, and they know it. So uh, there's a direct correlation between what they did and the dollar index. See? It's a correlation. There's a correlation between the dollar and oil because it's the petrodollar. But the, the, the dollar is also linked... Uh, into gold and silver, uh, but not as much as it's linked into oil, because that's why it's called the petrodollar, because it's really linked into oil, the, the value of the dollar, the U.S. dollar. And so what they did to protect the dollar, to keep it from going below 70 on the dollar index, was, is they artificially uh, 
attacked the price of gold and silver first. That's what they did. By creating these paper short contracts and dumping them into the market. Right? And these paper short contracts, dumping them into the market, lowered the price of gold and silver. And that, in turn, had an effect on the value of the dollar, and the dollar index went up. But there got to be to a certain point there where the dollar index wasn't being supported enough by what they were doing with the gold and silver. And that's when that they, they, they used oil. And that was the magic key to supporting the price of the dollar. And this is one of the things that helped, has helped them to get through till now, is get by all these years, is their artificial uh, reducing the price of these commodities. But, but the thing about these commodities, gold, silver, oil, you can only play these games with the prices uh, if you've got an underlying supply to equal the demand. For the actual for the actual commodity, so like with silver, sure you can play these prices. I mean, play these games, as long as you've got the underlying physical silver there to supply demand for the people who who want to actually purchase physical. So you can play these games, and you can play these games with the price as long as you've got that underlying supply. And it's the same way with gold, and it's the same way with with uh, oil. The jig's up. The game ends when there's not enough of the underlying supply to, to, to meet the demand for the physical. Uh, and, and so with gold and with oil, uh, they've got it covered for a while longer. They can play these games for a while longer with gold and with oil. Um, but where they're finding it hard is with silver because uh, I... Uh, the 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 actual physical supply has been dwindling over the years. Uh, they had, uh, I think it was back in, in, in the 1980s or something. They had something like 13 billion or something ounces of above ground physical supply, and in in that they it accumulated for thousands of years. Industry's been gobbling it up year after year, and it's not coming back. Uh, if in, in this, in, when they use it up in industry, they use it to make things like uh, solar panels and and uh, all kinds of different things. Even your socks and your shoes you're probably wearing right now got silver in them. They use it as a disinfectant uh, to stop germs. Uh, there's all kinds of uses for silver. It's in every cell phone. And this is gone. It's gone. Uh that was they were having enough supply coming in uh, to to supply industrial demand. They still do have enough supply from the mines coming in to, to supply industrial demand. Uh, a lot of the silver that they get comes from copper mining. So anyway, to make a long story short on silver is is uh, is uh, they're slowly but surely running out. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, and and there is going to come a time, not too distant future, where they can't control the price of silver any longer, because they're going to run out of the underlying physical supply. So then, what happens? What happens then? Well, the price of silver shoots up now. Now, because gold and silver are tied together at the hip, the price of silver shoots up. It's going to carry gold up somewhat with it. The two of them are going to rise, both of them. Uh, these are two of the uh, underlying factors that they've been using to keep the dollar in the in the position that it's in. Now, what about oil? Now, I said before that with oil, that if they, they have enough where they can uh, uh, manipulate the market price, but only to a point, because what's going to happen is, is they don't have, like with gold and silver, they have a tight grip on the pricing. They use the COMEX, and they have the pricing over in here, and they got the they've got tight control over it. But with 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 uh, oil, they don't have complete control over the pricing of it, and this is the holy grail to the price of the dollar is oil. And that what was helping them keep control over the price of oil was out in Texas, West Texas. There's a place called the Permian Oil Basin. 
the Permian uh, was supplying so much oil that OPEC was in a price war against the Permian. But OPEC was sitting back there and they were watching the Permian very carefully. And they were watching and waiting. And they, what they were waiting for was the Permian to go into decline. Well, it did. It happened a few months ago. The Permian went into decline. Now OPEC is the ones who really control the price of oil. And so now they're sending the price of oil slowly upwards. This is going to have a profound effect on the U.S. dollar because it's also combined with the price with them running out of the underlying supply of silver and the price of gold goes starting to go back up again because they they had to sell a lot of physical gold through rehypothecation in order to keep these prices down and a lot of that's gone to China now and China ain't giving it back. So what we're ha what's happening here all the way around the whole periphery of this whole thing. They're hitting the wall. They've kept this game going from 2008 till now, but now at this point, they're getting to the point where they're hitting the wall on this. So all of you people out there has been waiting for 2013, the crisis, 2014, 2015, didn't come, didn't come, 2016. 2016 comes and goes, and what happens to you? You're sitting back and you're starting to get complacent now, and you're saying to yourself, well, it's never coming. But you know, the thing about it is, is all those years was like the kid crying wolf and saying, oh, you got tired of waiting and you went, it's like the villagers, they came out. The kid, the kid, I'll tell you how that story went. There was a wolf and the kid was supposed to watch to see when the wolf would come in. So the kid, he's playing a joke and he yelled to the villagers up in the town. He said, oh, the wolf is here, wolf is here. And the wolf wasn't there, he's just joking. So then all the villagers came down with their pitchforks and everything to get the wolf, and the wolf wasn't there, and they're mad at the kid. They said, why do you cry wolf? The kid said, ha ha, I was joking, kid, yeah, ha ha. And they all went home. So then the kid did it again. He's supposed to watch for the wolf, and the kid yelled, cried wolf again. And they all came, the little villagers came out again to get the wolf. No wolf, and the kid played joke a second time, and he laughed at them. And they were mad this time, so they went back home. So the third time, the kid yells, wolf, wolf. Not one villager came because they cried wolf. Well, that's the way with this this crisis. They've been crying. 2012, they were crying. 2013, they were crying. Didn't come. It didn't come. 2014, 2015, 2016, didn't come. Didn't come. Didn't come. It's like crying wolf. And now what's happened is, is everybody's starting to get complacent. But you're getting complacent right at the inflection point. Where, where these guys can't hold it back any longer. They've held it back. They've held it back and held it back. They've fired all their bullets. They've dropped interest rates down to zero. They've done monetary stimulus as much as they can possibly do without destroying the, uh, the confidence in the currencies right at this point. Now, did you hear what I just said? Stop on that for a second. Think about it. They have done monetary stimulus to the point where they have, have taken it right to the point where if they do any more, they're going to start to destroy confidence in the currencies. But they've got this giant contraction coming that I told you about before. And when this contraction hits, they're going to have to go through this hyper-monetary stimulus. And when they do that, the confidence is going to be finally lost in these currencies simultaneously and it's it's not going to be a complete absolute confidence loss but what it's going to do is going to create a hyperinflation and you would be amazed at how long these people are going to stick with these currencies even though these currencies are hyperinflating they're going to stay with them they're going to follow them all the way down they will follow these currencies all the way down to zero they will still be using the United States dollar when they have to wrap elastic bands around a big wad of dollars this thick, and they don't even count them anymore. They weigh them on a scale. And you might go and you want to buy an egg, and they'll get to the point where it costs you five pounds of dollars to buy an egg, and the egg only weighs two ounces or whatever and you got to put five pounds of bills this is where we're heading but they will stick with that currency 
all the way down until it won't even buy an egg anymore. Until a wheelbarrow load of it will not even buy an egg. At that point, the government of the United States, all of their uh, unfunded liabilities that they, ha that they haven't been able to pay, all of their debt, all of it, will be paid. They'll be out of debt at that point. And then you can bet your bottom dollar that there's going to be some new form of currency that's going to come along. Because the world always has to have currency of one form or another. For monetary trade, you have to have, there's three aspects of money. Three basic aspects of money, according to me. Now, other people might, they might give you five assets or whatever. But I'm going to tell you the three basic assets of money that the, the way I put it. The first thing is fungibility. And if you guys have studied anything about money, you understand what fungibility means. It means that your $5 bill is worth the same as the other guy's $5 bill. So you can trade back and forth. It means that one ounce of gold is worth the same as any other ounce of gold. You can put it on a scale and you can trade back and forth. And the same thing with silver and so on. That's fungibility. <clears throat> the second aspect of money is a store of value. It means you can take your money and you can put it away wherever you want to put it. You can come back five years later and it's still, it's still worth something. It hasn't rotted. You can't do that with tomatoes. You take tomatoes and you put them away someplace for five years and you come back to get them and they're a big pile of stinking whatever. They're gone. They're rotted. Money doesn't rot. And the third aspect of money, which is probably the most important aspect of money, is that it is in limited supply. Okay, let's take a quick look at gold and silver. They cover those three aspects of money absolutely perfectly. Okay, let's take a look at Bitcoin. It covers, believe it or not, it covers those three aspects of money perfectly. And that's why it's become money. is because it covers those three aspects of money. But now let's take a look at these, these currencies. Well, they cover the first two aspects of money absolutely perfectly. But it's the third aspect of money, limited supply. That's where they fail. They fail miserably. They're, and, and they have worked. They have worked because the government hasn't completely gone hog-tied wild at creating monetary units. Not up till now they haven't. And this is why they've continued to work, because they have limited the, the supply to a certain degree. But what about when the day comes, when they, when they start to pull the stops out to try to stop the deflation, the contraction that I was telling you about? And they create this hyper-monetization. At that point, there's going to be no holding the stops back. No holding the bars back. And that's when it's going to really show up this fault. That they don't cover the third aspect of money, which is limited supply. There you go. So, <clears throat> we've, talked, we've covered these points. Another point I want to make is... Uh, if they were to allow, let's just follow this line of reasoning to its conclusion. Uh, about There's these uh, economists out there who believe we're going to have deflation. So let's just follow this a little bit further. What if the government did decide that they were not going to print all these enormous amounts of money, that they were going to let the contraction happen, and which would be the right thing to do, by the way. The wrong thing is to create all this money, but that's the easy way out. But when has the government ever did the right thing? They're not going to do the right thing. They're going to. They're, they're going to. They're not going to do the right thing, which is which is to allow the contraction to happen. So when the contraction occurs, right? Let's follow the line of reasoning. If the government did do the right thing and they didn't try to stop the contraction, what would happen? Well, can you just imagine it? Uh, the, the, that the, the prices of everything would just plummet. Then you really would have uh, your $700 gold. But it wouldn't even stop there. $700 an ounce. Drop $600, $500, $400, $300, $200. And what about silver? 
Silver wouldn't stop at twelve dollars. We go down ten nine eight seven six five four three two. Uh, two dot two bucks. And gasoline do the same thing. Gasoline wouldn't stop at 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 uh, a dollar a, a, a gallon in the United States. It dropped back down to where it used to be when I was a kid. I remember seeing gas for like twenty five cents a gallon. So, so you know, I mean, this is what would happen. You'd see twenty five cents a gallon gas again, or even cheaper. So now you get all these old people with social on social security, you know, and they get their social security check every from the government every. Now, can you imagine what would happen with these social security checks? You know, they're still getting the same amount of social security. They're getting like, like whatever they're getting now. It's they're getting it. And it's just a buying power. It'd be tremendous. Holy cow. This would be unbelievable. They would be able to go out and buy five cents a pound bananas and, 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 and 15 cents a gallon gas. And they would only use like $50 a month to live on. And all the rest they could bank, and silver at and and, and and silver at three dollars an ounce. You know, and gold at two hundred bucks or something. Imagine how much money, and and the government couldn't cover this. You got to be joking. <laughs> they couldn't even come close. The government would go broke in no time. So then, what would you have? They wouldn't be able to send these social security checks to all these seniors. You would have a mob. An enormous mob of seniors with their canes over their head, waving their canes like this, coming into Washington. And they would quite literally beat the politicians with these canes. Smack, smack, smack. Screaming at them at the same time. Old ladies with canes beating the politicians over the head with the canes. Where's my check? Do you really believe the politicians are actually going to go that route? When this, when this crisis comes, when Europe starts to go down the grain, down the toilet hole, and, and the banks are going down the toilet hole, and everybody's going down the toilet hole, all, of, all of the banks over here tied into the banks in Europe. And we're talking about an enormous implosion, implosion of the system, an enormous deflation. A deflation like these certain economists who believe in deflation. A deflation like is in their wildest dreams. That's what's coming. An amazing deflation. A deflation that's going to make them, they're just going to be, when it first happens, these economists who have been preaching this are going to be jumping up and down. Saying, I told you so, I told you so, I told you so, I told you so, I told you this was coming. That's what they're going to be doing. When it first happens. But by gosh. Listen guys. This is not going to last long. Because. it's It might not even last a few days. It's going to be the trigger. It's the trigger. This is the trigger. Because then. These governments and central banks. Do not underestimate what they've already told you. What they're going to do. They're going to come in with this hyper monetary stimulus. Like you've never seen before. And they're going to be the heroes when they bring in their monetary stimulus. And, and this is going to really turn the tide on everything. And so you're not going to ever get this deflation. The deflation, if it's the more severe the deflation is, the more it's going to trigger them into the hypermonetary stimulus. They're not going to let it happen. They're not going to allow it to happen. So, if you're sitting back, hoping and waiting for this deflation, when it starts to occur, you better get out there, and you better, during that period when the economists are jumping up, I told you so, I told you so, you better get out there and spend that money you've been saving for the deflation. Because when the government comes in and they turn this thing around, that money you've got and you've been saving ain't going to be worth nothing. Because they're going to destroy it. They're going to take it right down to its ultimate value, which is zero. And I can tell you this with 100% certainty. So if you got this question, you're saying to yourself whether it's going to be deflation or, or inflation. Well, 
the government's already told you what they're going to do. Helicopter Ben's already told you. So I'm not going to go over this any longer. I've kind of belated the point. And, and perhaps it needed to be the it needed to be it needed to be pounded so that you understand that this is the way it's going to really go ultimately this is where it's going to go uh so we've covered that point uh also i want to make the point that uh, that the earth now is past peak gold and peak gold and peak silver and peak oil we've passed all that now at this point and you might have these people out there say, oh, we've made a new oil discovery. We've discovered uh, enough oil to last into the 23rd century. It's all hype. It's all baloney. They're just looking to get funded so that they can make projects and dig for that oil. And then they're going to take a cut off of all that. They just want to get the banks, and they, they're, they're impressing the banks so that the banks will give them funding so that they can get that funding, and that's all about the funding. And then it's all about a little bit making a little bit of money. And it's all hype. We're past peak oil. Oil's now in decline, and so is gold and so is silver. All right? And the, and the silver miners, in order to stay in business the last two or three years, and, and, and the... It, Copper miners, all these miners have been having a miserable, miserable time because of the little bit of deflation we've been riding through. They're uh, they're 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 having such a hard time that that uh, that that they've been digging out the best of what they have left. They they have different places in their minds, like they have a, they might have an area over here. Where they got a higher grade ore than over than over here, you see, and so what they'll do is, is in hard times they'll go ahead and they'll find their good ore over here and they'll dig it, so that they can make profit, because they know if they dig this ore over here, that it's not going to yield as much, and that they won't make a profit, so that they don't dig over here. Well, what they've been doing is they've been digging in their best ore and they've been digging it all out. It's not there anymore. They've dug it. They've dug most of it. They're past the peak, and then that's why we saw these these production increases and everything it was because they're digging in their best places. To dig, and it's all been discovered. They went over and they've scanned the whole earth for this stuff. They've looked down into the ground everywhere practically, and 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 there's the the huge discoveries are already gone. Oh yeah, there's still a few discoveries out there, but you're going to find that they're harder and harder to, to, to get. They're deeper in the soil. They're in more outlandish places where you got to go into the middle of nowhere. And there's no even ray roads there. You getting my point? We're past. It's past it. And, and anybody that tells you different, they don't know what in the hell they're talking about. These things are all going into decline now. And the reason why is, and that's the reason why we went into the contraction in 2008 in the first place. Was because we're finally, uh, we're on a finite planet. And we've reached the, 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 the inflection point. We've passed it. And now everything is declining. Everything's pulling back. Everything's shrinking. But they can't let, because the original monetary supply was based on exponential growth, in other words, a Ponzi scheme, they can't allow that to shrink. Because if it shrinks, it explodes into a complete and utter devastating deflationary spiral. And, and the further they let that go, the more monetary stimulus they need to bring us out of it. So they're not going to let it go very far. Because the more it contracts, the more monetary stimulus they need to get it back out. So they can't let it go in very far. See what I mean? They can't let it. They can't let it shrink very far, because it'll get so hard for them to bring it back out. It'll take oople, oopels, oopels amounts of money, and then they'll destroy the value of the money. So this is the situation that they're in. They're caught between a rock and a hard place. Just like right now, they can't. They can't raise interest rates, and and they can't lower them. <laughs> They're caught between a rock and a hard... Well, I shouldn't say they can't raise interest rates. They can raise them 25 basis points. They, they could probably do one more or 
a couple more 25 basis points. But that's nothing. That's only a half of a point. And, you know, it's almost funny. It's almost ludicrous, the fact that a half of a point would even affect the price of gold. <laughs> What's that all about? <laughs> You know, I mean, or or even a core or twenty five basis points would affect the price of gold. What's that all about? I can understand five points having an effect. You know, but twenty five basis points has an adverse effect on the price of gold. Get serious. I don't know. This is because everything now is on trading algorithms and stuff. They got everything connected to computers. And computers move the price of everything. They're controlling the price of everything. They don't even have markets anymore. So let's move on here. <clears throat> uh, on our discussion, we've pa uh, passed peak gold and silver. Uh, Yeah, and and it's because it's because these guys are greedy. That's why they give you these overestimates of what's in the ground for gold, silver, and they want they want to get funding from the banking system. So uh, so I've basically in in this thing I've, I've given you an overview, and what I want you to understand is we finally reached the point where the crisis is getting ready to happen. Probably within the next eighteen months. Probably sooner than that. Probably within this year. And there's so many things coming at us that could actually trigger it, not just Europe. It's getting ready to happen, and you better batten the hatches. You better be prepared, because this thing is going to be nasty. And it's not going to be nasty at first, because at first, what they're going to do is, is everything's going to stimulate. They're, what we've been going through, uh, we've been going through a period of deflation. But it has only been moderate deflation. It's been controlled deflation. And and it's been going along with a bit of stagflation along with it. This period is, is kept coming to a close. And we've been able to deal with it, but it's, it's not felt good. They've been calling it a, a, uh, a recovery. It hasn't been a recovery. It, it, everything fell down in 2008 and the whole thing's just been bottom bouncing along ever since. And, and it's, it's been a, it's, it hasn't even been a recession. It's been ever since 2008 till now, it's actually been a depression. We've been in, a, a, a not a real bad depression, but we've been in a depression since 2008 till now. This is not really dangerous. It's not a collapse. It's not a recovery. It's 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 got stagflation and it's 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 miserable. Uh, people are out of work. The, the economy is not recovered. People know it's not recovered if they're really out there looking at it, you know. And so we've been suffering through this. But we're nearly through this period. And now what's going to happen is, is when they open the floodgates of money, really open them up with this hyper monetization. Things are going to feel good at first. It's going to create jobs. It's going to feel good. It's going to it's going to be like like a dose of uh, for a heroin user, like getting a dose of heroin. They feel good when they first get it, and that's what the economy is like. The economy is like a drug user. It's been on drugs all this time, but they haven't been getting their dose. And right now they're going through the the DTs or whatever when they're Whoa, they don't feel good and they're shaking all over. They need a dose. That's because they've been going through this period of deflation. It's almost over. And this little trigger that's coming, that's going to trigger the next contraction. That contraction is not going to, it's going to be so short-lived that it's not even hardly worth talking about. But like I say, these economists are going to be jumping up and down going, Yee, we told you. It's going to last long enough for them to jump up and down a few times and yell, we told you, we told you it was coming. Dow's going down, everything's going down. You know, crashing, everything's crashing. You know, the 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 the, uh, the the dollar's crashing, everything's crashing. They're going to be just saying, we told you so, we told you so. But it's only going to last a very short period of time before the government comes into the rescue. And it's going to be all over the television when it happens, just like it was in 2008. Well, maybe not now. It might be on all over the television. It might be on the Internet. 
but it's going to be there, and you're going to know what's happening. And they're going to tell you it's a crisis, an enormous, gigantic crisis. And this is going to give them the reason that they need to open the floodgates of money. And when they open those floodgates of money, man, I'm going to tell you at first, it's good. after going through this deflationary period, it is going to feel good. But it's not going to last real long either. And that's when you're really going to, the world's really going to hit the fan and they're really going to have the problems. And then you're going to have the real hyperinflation, not just fake hyperinflation. People saying, oh, it's coming next year. We're going to have hyperinflation. No, 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 no. This is going to be the real stuff. This is going to start out with high inflation at first, but then it's going to get worse and worse and worse. And ultimately, it's, 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 it's coming, boys. Now we've got it really coming. So I wanted to give you guys this talk to let you know and kind of just kind of set the stage for you so you'd understand the dynamics of how this whole thing's going. And I've tried my best to, to really help you to understand how, this, how these dynamics are working out there right now and how it's leading to a crisis and then to, and, and then to a hyperinflationary problem that's going to be worldwide. Uh, thank you very much for listening and uh, su subscribe and, uh, and, uh, and and like my channel and give me a thumbs up. And I really enjoy making these videos for you guys. And <clears throat> I uh, I hope I did a good job of uh, trying to explain how these uh, how how this is going to function in the very near future. Thank you very much. Bye bye.